As for the delay, I was, uh, I guess I'm a little scatterbrained tonight. Usually, and it's appropriately so, that as we, as we study the Word of God, as, as we come to this part of the, our worship, and, and the learning and the aspect, the, the teaching, the preaching occur, many times we focus upon the, uh, the, the theory, as it were, the principles, and from that we draw conclusions to which we, we understand. There's a practical as aspect of this. In fact, if, if, as one studies uh, the, the epistles that, that Paul wrote, he followed a certain pattern where he would open up and, de and begin with uh, uh, principles, with theory with, with uh, the teaching regarding spiritual matters, and then toward the end of the epistle, he'll, he would address practical applications of what he had just taught. Well, tonight, I would like to focus upon some practical aspects of the Christian walk, in particular, temptation and its solution. Uh, we'll be looking at 2 Peter chapter 2 in a, in a, in a while, but before we get there, we'll look to cover some other things. What is man's greatest need? What is man's greatest problem, and that certainly is, man's greatest problem is sin. In fact, that's the whole point of God's saving, God's scheme of redemption to save mankind, and sending his son to die upon the cross to shed his blood to take care of the sin problem. That's one aspect of the sin problem that man has. The fact that he has sin, we know from, from Romans 3.23 that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. But because of that sin problem, the consequences are very severe, and we're aware of that too from Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But then God's solution is the latter part of that verse in Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's God's solution to man's sin problem. And that God's solution is man's, to great, man's greatest problem is Jesus Christ, his satisfying atonement, that is his shed blood on the cross, and man's obedient faith. That's the answer to the solution of, of uh, man's problem, that is, of sin. But the temptation to sin still creeps all about us. It's always uh, about us, and there we always, should always be aware of that. As we consider that Satan is, as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. And so as we, we think about man's sin problem, the temptation to sin is still there before us because we still are here on the face of this earth. We still have human appetites that God has given us and that because of our environment, the way we have learned that, that uh, to satisfy these appetites and the, the life that we had led before we obeyed the gospel may have put us in us a, a second nature, as it were, to walk after the rudiments of this world and satisfy these appetites in an unlawful way. So as we have turned about, have we come up out of that watery grave of baptism with a renewed mind, a new spirit, a new creature to walk in, in, in righteousness, to walk in purity, to walk in the light, even as our Lord has walked in the light, the, the, the temptation to sin and turn away and, and to, shall I say, sour that, which God, that blessing that God has given us, is always there. So as we think about the temptation and its solution, you know, God has not left us without a solution to the problems that we have. As we think about the temptations that we have, how are we tempted? How are we tempted to sin against God and against ourselves, against our fellow man? You know, Satan, a very real presence in this world, and, and, and uh, uh, he's still involved with deceiving men and tempting them to sin. As you think in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the exhortation by, by Peter is to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's ever on the prowl. And we should always be aware of that and be ready to deal with the, the temptations that he'll throw at us at a moment's notice. That's, and, and literally, that's the case many times. You know, all mankind is tempted. As we can pa continue with this, this passage in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Uh, talking about Satan. To resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So that as we consider the temptations we are confronted with, it's no different for everyone Every Christian, or all the brethren across the face of the earth, they are tempted in the same way as we are. Um, and as we know that Satan uses known tactics to tempt us, as we consider 1 John 2, 16, 
the, the tactics he uses are well known by now. It's been thousands of years that his, his abilities and, and wiles are, are, uh, uh, are known and revealed to us as God has given us the solution to our temptation problem. It's revealed to us that in, in 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. As we think about these lusts that we have in us, the lust of the world, what is as offer, the lust of the flesh, you know, satisfying our appetites, our hunger, our thirst, and other appetites that God has given us, and the lust of the eyes. You know, Eve was presented with the same with temptation in the same exact way in all three areas when, when Satan approached her in the form of a serpent. He appealed to her through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And all three of these were met in the same temptation. And she was beguiled by Satan in saying that surely you shall not die if you partake of this fruit. Well, he was, a, he was a liar from the beginning and a murderer from the beginning. So he uses these tactics and these, these ways to appeal to us, pulling on those strings, on those, our chains, knowing how we're going. You know, he knows quite a bit about us and how we would be, uh, be tempted. You know, Satan uses ministering servants. Satan uses ministering servants. If you think about in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, uh, the fact is Satan uses Christians. He uses false prophets. He uses whomever and whatever he can at his disposal to tempt faithful uh, Christians to uh, fall, to stumble, to, to sin against God. And it wasn't just during the Christian age that he's been doing this, but all through the Mosaic age and all through the patriarchal age, he has been presenting temptations to mankind to sin. So as we consider 2 Corinthians 11, beginning of verse 14. And no marvel for Satan himself. It's the marvel it wasn't is you know, the fact that uh, there would be these false prophets prophets that would come in, false teachers that Satan would use, and, and as Paul continues in writing, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing for if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So even Satan has his own people yeah, uh, infiltrating into the church. Think about that. And I'm not so sure that, that the people are privy to the fact that Satan is using them to further his, his will. Uh, you recall when, when uh, uh, Christ asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Okay, first he asked, who do men say that I am? Then he asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, I the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he was commended for this this uh, confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In fact, he makes the statement upon this rock, this rock, this foundational bedrock that Peter had just confessed, that he was the Son of God, that Jesus would build his church. But immediately, he, as he began to teach his disciples that he would be taken into custody and would be executed on the cross, Peter said, took him aside and said, no way. This is not going to happen to you. And Jesus rebuked Peter. And he called, what did he call him? He called him Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. It wasn't that Peter was literally Satan, but Satan was using Peter as a stumbling block for Christ. Think about it. Christ knew he was going, to, he was going for his last trip to Jerusalem to be, to be nailed to that cross. And he knew this, and he, it, that's why he came to this earth to die upon that cross, a propitiation for the sins of mankind. And the fact that one of his own disciples, a very close disciple of his, that was presenting him with this temptation not to go through with this. It was a grave temptation. And so Jesus perceived this as a way for Satan to get inside and use Peter for this purpose. And so it is, even within the Lord's church, there are those who, who, whom Satan will use for his purposes in destroying a congregation. He'll use uh, temptations, he'll use dissatisfaction, he'll use uh, discouragement, all these tools at his disposal to get inside the Christians in the church to tear it apart. Okay, um, you're familiar with various things that, that will tear a uh, congregation apart. Uh, uh, people diminishing in their love one for the other. People involved with uh, gossip and tail uh, tail bearing things like that. Things that would tear apart, cause Christians to lose their trust in each other, and lose their concern and love for one another. Things that that Satan will use to tear a congregation apart. We need to understand that as this is a tactic of his, we, and, and our desire is, of course, to defeat Satan, 
we don't want him to get a foothold in this congregation. And so we watch ourselves so that we will not be an avenue through which Satan can attack the Lord's church in Roy City or anywhere else that we happen to be. Um, so what is used to tempt us? We know that riches are a temptation which we are warned to steer away from. How does one avoid the temptations which so many in this world are drawn toward? How do we as Christians draw away from those things that would draw us away from Christ, draw us away from our focus upon walking the way to heaven, keeping faithful to God, by taking control of our dreams and our, and our ambitions? Think about this. We're warned about the temptation of the riches from 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. As Paul is writing to Timothy regarding this, there are those in his day, in Paul's day, and still are today, that think that the Christian way is a way to profit, a way to great gain. And their concern isn't with gain spiritually, but rather making merchandise of the Lord's people and making gain in that effort. But, and he's condemning this, but then he goes on to say... Uh, that, but godliness with contentment is great gain. There is great gain in the Christian walk through godliness and contentment, not with the, the gaining of wealth, but rather through the real riches, the spiritual riches that God blesses us with as Christians. For we, were brought, noth for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. How do we combat the temptations we might have regarding the riches of this world by focusing upon what's real and what's of real value, the spiritual wealth, the spiritual treasures, and getting rid of those ambitions and, and desires that would draw us to uh, uh, attraction to the, what the world has to offer us. We're warned to, that to take up ambitions of wealth and power opens the doors to our own doom. In, in verse 9 of the same chapter, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. You know what a snare is? You know, we've, anybody's, we've, I've never built one, but I've seen plans on how to build a snare for a rabbit. Okay, if you're out in the, in the, in the field and you're camping and you, you desire to have a rabbit for dinner, make rabbits stew or whatever, you set up a snare for that rabbit and when the rabbit trips into it, he's captured and you can, you can then take him and use him as, as your, your uh, nutrition, as you, your, uh, your meal. And so this is a snare to capture the rabbit. So we think about this snare that we would have in this world that would cause us to trip up to capture us for Satan's purpose and, and to lose our souls, our lives, uh, that uh, uh, we would fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through many sorrows. The riches of this world has drawn them away to chase after this wealth, and they're drawn away from the faith. They're drawn away to lose their soul. They have pierced themselves with many sorrows. But now the ASV renders this passage. You know, some people think that money is the root of all evil, and that's how it's sometimes presented. Well, we know that it's not the money that's the root of all evil. You know, we're, we're taught that uh, those of us who have control of great wealth or have the ability to handle it, that there is a responsibility that goes along with that. As we consider uh, God gives us with, with ability and with opportunity come responsibility. Okay? And so the, the wealthy are, are uh, taught by the Lord that they, they take their stewardship uh, seriously as it regards to the kingdom of heaven. But as we think about uh, those of uh, most of us, myself included, that don't have the, that talent to, do, to, to gain much wealth, uh, but I still can fall to this, for the snare of a desire for that. And so, but it's not the money that's the root of all evil, because money can be used for good as well. But it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. But it's not all evil. Because money is not the only motivating factor for sinning. As the ASV puts it in the same, in the same verse, 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay? Every kind of evil you think of, many times money is the root of that. The, the love of money, I should say. The love of that money is the root of all kinds of evil. So every sin you can think of under the sun can sometimes be motivated by one's love 
of, my, of money, to desire to have more of it. And as he continues, which some reaching have, uh, after have been led astray from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So we're warned about that. So as we consider where do we focus in our Christian life, you know, as, as we know, we live in this world. We live in the world, and there are certain things we need to, to uh, uh, provide. God's given us the ability to provide through his providential care, and part of that ability to provide for ourselves, as it were, through the blessings of God, is making money. Money is a great medium of exchange. And, and so we understand there is a certain necessity for us to have a certain amount but to have that lust of it and desire for it as, as it's the main purpose in our life, that's when we're drawn away from the spiritual riches which God uh, wants to give us. But if we turn away from it, then, of course, we can't be blessed by God. So as we think about to be safe, to stay safe in this world, we stay in the faith. That's the essential aspect of it. And as we consider with the next verse, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, But thou, O man of God... Flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. All these things. This is about staying in the faithful, in the faith, staying faithful to God and not being swayed one way or the other to draw to the things that this world has to offer because ultimately this world has nothing to offer us. This world has nothing to offer us. As, as, as we think about, ultimately, how successful temptations are is dependent upon our resolve to resist them. How successful is temptation again in, in your life? When I say that, I, you, you understand my meaning. How successfully can temptation take you away and run you away from God? What is, and what does it depend upon? It depends upon our own resolve to uh, resist the devil, to flee these things, our resolve to resist them. As James 1, verse 14 says, James identifies what is the real root of our sins. Of course, we understand we are tempted by, by Satan. We are tempted by the things in this world. And we, we do things or we adjust our attitudes so that we are least likely to be tempted. But nevertheless, we are tempted, as we see in ver James 1, 14, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my, bro my beloved brethren. So we know that what is the, what is ultimately, where is the, the guilt of sin rest? It's within ourselves. And we're tempted when we are drawn away of our own lust. When our lust is, is teased, okay, our desire is... is uh, uh, put before us through the things that, that Satan would offer before us, others would offer before us, what we would think we need so much in this world, and we're tempted by the lust. And if we allow that to, to happen, that the temptation, when lust has conceived, it's like a birth. That's what he's saying. When lust is conceived, and it brings forth what? It brings forth sin. It's like sin is born. And when, and, when it's, and when a sin is full grown, when it's finished, it bringeth forth death. So this is why we're warned in 1 John 2, 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we need to be careful about our attitudes about things that the world has to offer us. And not think that it's so important that we need to wrap our whole existence around them. We need to stay focused on the Father, on the Son, and His what he, they have done for us to save us from this life, from this world. And, and so that we are not drawn away to a, a base worldly existence that so many in this world are, are, are focused upon, but rather we transcend that through the truth that Christ has brought us. So God wants us to be victorious over temptation. Absolutely wants us to be victorious over temptation. As, as he will not be tempted, as we think about ourselves that God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to bear. As we consider 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God wants us to defeat temptation. God wants us to defeat sin. And so he's armed us with tools that we can. As we look in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but as such is as common to man. Remember previously in the passage that we looked at that uh, Christians all over the world are, are tempted with this, 
are tempted just like we are. As we see here, that no temptation is taking you but such as common to man. So whatever has caused us to stumble in the past, it's not beyond what other has, others have been tempted by. Okay? We're not tempted beyond more than anybody else has ever been tempted. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above you that you are able. That's not to say that, he, that God adjusts the level of temptation that you're able to bear so he doesn't allow Satan to, to tempt you beyond what he knows your limitations are. That's not what this passage is saying. What this passage is saying is that anyone who has ever fallen to sin, it's not that his temptation is any greater than anybody else's. Okay? It's common to man that they're all tempted, and the fact that the level of temptations anybody's been tempted it is, it is that mankind has been able to bear it. Okay? But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, it's a fact. God will make a way for us to escape temptation. And we just need to prepare for that. I think of Joseph, young Joseph in the house of Potiphar, when his wife, Potiphar's wife, was day by day enticing and tempting young Joseph to sin with her. And each day he would reject that, uh, uh, what would you say, that w the terms we normally would use for this uh, approach, a front. And so each day, and then finally she, she cornered him, had all the servants sent out so everything would be quiet, nothing would, would, would distract from her intention to get Joseph in a compromising situation. And as she approached him and expressed her desire to be with him, he said, how can I sin against you, Potiphar, and God so greatly? And so he tore out of there. He ran away. That was his escape that God had given him. That anyone who would want to escape that situation, that was the avenue through which he could. And so Joseph defeated that temptation in that mental preparedness and being ready to answer that, that temptation when it confronted him. And this was a case, not necessarily in a moment's notice, but certainly would come, have come upon him quickly, but he was certainly had, been, had time to prepare mentally and emotionally to deal with that. Um, there are other ways. Jesus, how did he deal with the temptation? You know, it's very, we think about the, the temptation that Satan presented him. When Jesus went out into the wilderness, the Holy Spirit led Jesus out to the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And, at, at, and during that time, at the end of that time, Satan comes to him, confronts him, and presents to him three different temptations. And as each one was given him, they had to be real temptations to Jesus. Otherwise, what was the use? What was the temptation? And each time you recall that, that in one case, Satan presented him with scripture to justify, you know, you're famished, Jesus. You're hungry. You need nourishment. And as the scripture says, you can make these stones into bread. So make these stones into bread so you can be properly nourished. This is good and wholesome and healthy. Do it. But this was a misapplication of the scripture. And so Jesus saw for what it was, and rather being falling for the temptation to do something that seemingly was good, much like Eve saw that this fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was good for food, Jesus certainly would have seen these low, the lows that could come from these stones was good for nutrition. He was famished. He'd been, he'd been fasting for 40 days. And yet he correctly applied this scripture by putting its right perspective that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of, that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Okay. And, and so in, in resisting Satan for these, each of these temptations, he was given access to the rule of the whole world. I'm not sure... You and I, as we've never had been given opportunity to rule the world, we think about where Jesus came from, being creator of the world. You know. And so as each time that, that Satan presented his temptation, he confronted Satan and answered the temptation with Scripture, keeping his mind focused upon what was righteous before God, following after God and putting God first and not himself. So he was prepared in that fashion. Um, so we consider the way of escape, and, and I, I suppose that if given the situations that we might be tempted, there is an avenue through which we can avoid the sin. 
Much time, it's a matter of being prepared. Many times it's being prepared with knowledge. More on that a little later. You know, there's no magical method to avoid temptations. There's not a magical way to ensure we will not fall either. There's no magic about it. Okay, It's a matter of being prepared, being resolved not to sin. As we consider David, what he wrote in one of the Psalms, had, he had the best answer to be prepared for the moment when we are tempted. You know, being tempted, it's no sin to be tempted. It, it's no sin. Temptation will come. And, and just because we're tempted, tempted does not mean that we are in sin. It really seems we are resented with the opportunity to stumble, opportunity to sin. And so a lot of that involves being prepared. And as David prepared his mind in Psalm 119, verse 11, Psalm 119, verse 11, he says, Thy word, speaking to the Father, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. What's the most powerful tool we have to defeat Satan and his temptations? The word of God. His word, the knowledge we garner from that. It's a matter of resolve to defeat Satan and temptation. As we resist the devil, as James wrote in four, James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You want to defeat Satan? Resist him and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. As we consider all of us who are in the situation where, hey, maybe I am double-minded. Maybe I haven't been focused solely upon the Christian walk. Maybe I do have desires outside of the, my Christian walk. And I need to get rid of my double-mindedness, purify my heart, and focus upon God, and resist the devil, and draw nigh to God. And what's the, what's the, the blessings that come from drawing nigh to God? He'll draw nigh to us, draw near to us. Jesus, of course, has shown us the way to defeat the tempter in the desert, all alone, under great pressure to sin. Yet, he answered Satan's darts with power. Jesus had the power to answer Satan, and that was the sword of the Spirit. You know what I'm talking about. We can be victorious over temptation. As we think about Ephesians chapter 6, you'll, you'll recognize this moment uh, very quickly as we consider the armor that we, that we are given to do spiritual warfare in times of temptation. As, as Paul uh, writes to the, the church in Ephesus in chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. God has given us the implements whereby we may defeat Satan. He's given the tools we need to defeat Satan in our lives. Okay? If he, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So there is armor that God has given us that we can stand against the devil when he confronts us. When I say confronts us, you will never see him directly, one-on-one, -on -one, as he really is. He's too subtle for that. He's too smart for that. If we saw Satan as he really is, we'd identify him in an instant and noted, noted what we needed to defeat him. But as he's very subtle and, can, and uh, will tempt us in a way that sometimes we don't recognize what's really going on, that's another aspect of our being able in preparing to defeat Satan is preparing to be able to identify when we are tempted to see this isn't going the right way. I see what's coming up here. I need to take a turn off this road that's leading right to the temptation. That'll lead me right into sin. Uh, so God has given us the implements in the armor of God. This is a spiritual warfare we're dealing with, and we need spiritual weapons. And so he has given us these weapons as we continue in chap, uh, verse, 11, uh, verse 12, pardon me. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this, darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we are going to bat, go battle with human armies, human opponents. We're going to, to battle with spiritual entities with principalities and high, you know, uh, wickedness in high places, spiritual wickedness, wickedness in high places. So we need the tools, the armor, the, the weapons to defeat that spiritual warfare, in that, that spiritual battle in our spiritual warfare. So in verse 13 we read, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. We need to be prepared. We put on the whole armor. You know, if a firefighter was going into a, to uh, enter a, a, a building that was on fire to save somebody in there, he wouldn't just carry a hose and an axe. 
he'd have all of his equipment with him, all the breathing apparatus, the helmet, the, the, the heat insulation, the, 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 the clothing that the fireman, that the fire department provides him so he can enter into that burning building and safely, relatively speaking, enter in to, to save the life of those who might be in there. Even the infrared uh, uh, vision equipment so that they can identify human beings in all the smoke. They can see right through that smoke and see the individuals and go collect them rapidly and get out of there to safety. But if he wouldn't out in there without his breathing apparatus, he'd, be, he'd succumb to the carbon monoxide and instantly fall down. And so a fireman to properly save lives puts on all of his equipment. And so a Christian, a soldier, uh, think of a Roman soldier. When he would go into battle, he would have all his equipment there that would ensure his survival as best it could be. It's a dangerous world to go into battle. And so putting everything on, all his tools to be able to, 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 to do battle effectively and survive was essential. And so that's as we look at this, as we wrestle not against flesh and blood, we put on our spiritual armor, we put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is spiritual warfare. We need spiritual weapons. So in verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So in verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So what do we do to do all? Verse 14, we have six items we prepare ourselves with. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. As when, when, and the clothing they wore in that day, if they were going to do something physical like running or doing battle, they would take their clothing, their, their robes, and they'd, they'd, they'd gird them up. They'd wrap them around their, their loins. That's called girding your loins. You'd wrap them up so that your legs were free to move. Okay? So we would gird our loins with truth. That's the gospel truth of God. And having on the breastplate of, breastplate of righteousness, we know the breastplate is to protect the, the, the uh, most important cavity of our, of our body. We're in our heart, our lungs, all our vital organs are in place there, so we have the breastplate to protect us against, against Satan and his wiles, and that breastplate is righteousness. It's our right living. It's our right attitude, our desire, our resolve to be right with God. And number three, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Our feet were shod. You know that the, we, they don't, uh, we don't study Roman... Uh, uh, military equipment very much is not very pertinent these days. But yet, when the, in that day, to shod your feet, the, the Roman soldiers had a special, had special foot gear. And they'd put it on, they had spikes coming out of the sole. So as they would go into battle, their spikes would dig into the earth to give them a solid foundation to, from which to fight. So they had strength as they would go in with their, with their sword and their shield and their helmet and their, and their breastplate, all these implements. And without those feet being shod with those spikes on the bottom, much like a golfer spikes, that he, with those, he enables him to lunge and, and force, have a forceful uh, attack. So the, the putting on, the shodding our feet with a proper attire was important as it is preparation of the gospel of peace. With preparation of the gospel, our understanding of the gospel, as Jesus contended with Satan, with, with scripture, so we too can contend with Satan with preparing ourselves with the gospel of, of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith. Of course, we know the shield will protect us from blows from the enemy, from the blows from his short, sword. And so we sh our shield of faith, our faith will uh, keep us from being knocked over, knocked down, bludgeoned. Our shield of faith, our faith, our belief, our, our trust in God and trust in Christ, our faith in what we know to be true, from the revealed word of God, revealed by the Holy Spirit to those men who were writing, inspired to write. And so we, we, we carry that shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts. No matter what, what they might shoot at us, whatever Satan might shoot at us, we can block it all with that shield of faith. So the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation to protect our heads, our salvation that God has given us, that Christ has given us, our salvation is real and sure so long as we are faithfully walking in the Lord. As we have devoted ourselves to being right before God, God is our friend and we hold him as such. Yes, God is divine. Yes, God is the creator of the universe.
but so much that God has done for us to save us, certainly God is our friend. And we do not try to, to deceive our friends. We try to live right with them. Our, our lives are right with them, our friends. As we think about uh, the helmet of our salvation, which our God has given us to protect our head, and then, of course, the sword of the Spirit, that sword of the Spirit, that, that offensive weapon and defensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit, what Christ used so effectively against Satan and so many others. As David said, he hid the word, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That was the sword of the Spirit. What did he say? So, and, and, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The strength, that offensive weapon to defeat evil, evil influences, persuasions, the word of God. It, re, it, it uh, exposes error. It exposes false doctrine. It reveals the truth that God would have us to know to find salvation. And it is an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon against false doctrines. It reveals false doctrines. So these are the implements that God has provided us to defeat Satan and the temptations that will be before us. What's of paramount importance is our resolve to follow through. Our resolve to be right with God. And so when we're confronted with temptation, we know what to do. Because we've rehearsed it in our head. We've rehearsed it in, in our studies. We know what to do, and we know how to identify the temptations to sin. And so we follow through because we love God, and he loves us. So as we think about temptation and its solution, God has given us a solution. And it's, it really is being prepared ahead of time so that we give the right answer and the right response to the temptation so as to defeat Satan and his, and his encroachment upon our freedom and our liberty and upon our faith and our resolve to serve God. I mentioned earlier that the man's greatest problem is sin, and it is. And God gave us the answer for man's greatest problem. Man has sin. All, all has sin and comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's God's answer to man's sin problem. Other than that, there's no answer. There's no answer other than what God has done for us in sending his son to, to die upon the cross to shed his blood. That's a propitiation, a, a, a satisfying atonement for God's justice, whereby because of what Jesus did in dying on the cross and shedding his blood, we might be saved. We might be saved. There's no guarantee we'll be saved. What do I mean? There are lots of people who reject the very idea. There are lots of people that, that don't believe in, that there's any such thing as sin. That's a concoction of, of people to try to control others. But the fact is, God has revealed to us that we do have sin. Sin is very real, and it's encroachment, and it's, and it's a destroyer of our relationship with him. It's our iniquities have separated us from our God. And so because of this man's sin problem, he separates from God, and the end result is death, but God gives us the answer. Not in any great thing we can do, because as we sang uh, either this evening or, or this morning, that Jesus Christ paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away, and that's Jesus Christ. He washes our sins away. As we consider... The, our faith in God and Christ and our confessing that faith that Jesus is the Son of God, just as his disciples did when, when he asked them. And so with that understanding, with our sin, we must do something about it. As he said, I tell you, ex I t I tell you nay, except ye repent, ye shall in like manner perish. We understand we must repent of our sins because of our faith. We must repent of our sins. And in so doing, we must, as Peter has said, as Ananias told Paul when he was, uh, when Christ had appeared to him, he was told to go to the city, he'd be told what he must do. And he was given the opportunity to be saved as well. And as Ananias approached him, Paul had been praying for three days. He'd been fasting for three days. He was very serious. He was blinded on the road to Damascus, and he couldn't see. So this was very Serious for Paul, not only was his means of getting along in this world had come to a, a, a close in, as far as he could tell,
but more importantly, his this disposition of his soul, this everlasting disposition was, was, was it made very real. And you know, it's very interesting that some people don't understand the seriousness and the reality of the fact we need to make a choice. We need to make a choice to whether to believe God or not. And if we believe God, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to obey him or not? So as Paul was in the house in Damascus, praying for three days, fasting for three days, and Ananias comes to him. I'm not sure that, that we're told everything that, that Ananias said. But one thing we do know, as Paul relates the events, as, as and Ananias says, And now why tarriest thou, Saul? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what Paul needed to do to the fine salvation. And that's what we all need to do for the fine salvation. As Peter gave the same instructions on the day of Pentecost, when they, was, all they, they were there asking, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter said, repent ye, every one of you, rather I should say, repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we know that Baptism is an essential aspect of the gospel of Christ that when we believe God, we learn that there's something we're supposed to do, and that is be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And in so doing, we find forgiveness of sins, laying hold of everlasting life, and the appropriate response to God to find everlasting life. As, second, as 1 Peter 3.21 tells us, that baptism also now, doth now save you, not the, the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's what baptism is. It's the right answer to the, the problem, sin problem of man. The right answer to God as we appeal to God for forgiveness of sins. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation, then come forward as we stand, as we sing. <laughs>